This story will cover from then to now and next, all about change, how to turn losers into winners. Everyone's favourite, the comical clown of the sea, now even being checked out by the paparazzi about its food preferences. But when it connects with us, the picture is a lot less amusing, indeed tragic, for the famous puffin. A particularly shocking example came ashore by the bridges over the Firth of Forth in Scotland. Their name, like the puffins themselves, may suggest something humorous, but they are anything but. Each nurdle is tiny, about the size of a lentil, a few millimetres. And this is where the story starts, a few miles away at Grangemouth, a massive petrochemical factory. Those nurdles, 300 billion a week, are produced here to be turned into plastic for supermarkets and so on, for food trays, bottles and much else. And as we now well know, microplastics can kill. According to the Sunday Times, the chairman and chief executive of INEOS, one of the biggest producers of plastic in the world, has been targeted by campaigners. His name is Sir James Ratcliffe, with a previous estimated fortune of 18 billion pounds, third in the rich list. So this is quite a story, a picture about winners and losers, featuring the not so comical clown of the sea. Seriously. They're a kind of orc with an A, not H as in hawk. They're all sorts and they depend on the sea, its fish and therefore its condition. Populations can vary and we need to know why, as all seabirds can prove to be warnings from the wild, indicating sand eel stocks or young fry of larger fish. So why did these tufted puffins crash off St Paul Island between Russia and Alaska in late 2016? An estimated 7,000 individuals died, apparently as the result of a Pacific marine heat wave. In the UK, another orc, the Guillemot, has been studied by Professor Tim Burkhead of the University of Sheffield since 1972. It seems they and the puffins and other seabirds are all in decline. Certainly the weather affected Atlantic puffins recently with heavy rain in Northumberland. This kind of downpour will flood the landscape and offshore, in this case, the Farne Islands, famous for its puffin colonies. So is it glad tidings for these popular characters, winning or losing, at the mercy of weather, food and the dreaded plastic? We'll see. So will she. Lots of puffins, but how many chicks or pufflings have been drowned in their burrows on the farms? How many parents can't get enough fish at sea? And as in the past, they had to switch from scarce sand eels, their favorite, to pipefish, which have spines which choke the chick, and they may contain some deadly microplastics, which some humans produce and others cast aside. Well before the time of useful and useless plastics, now flooding the sea, this traditional home for puffins and other seabirds was changing. The Farne Islands, 28 of them, have been inhabited for more than 1300 years, first by monks and hermits, then as a military garrison, then tenants who grazed them and harvested eggs, birds, eiderdown and seals. Later, Lighthouse keepers and their families kept their lamps burning, warning ships away from these dangerous rocks 
now attractive to a food chain of avian fishermen, from small fish experts like kittiwakes and puffins to piratical scavengers like black back gulls. Take cover underground. When the coast literally is clear, there's the problem of finding your burrow and your mate again. Puffins pair for life and live up to 30 years and more, and the puffling will leave at night to avoid predation, and with no guidance from its parents. Yes, they may seem comical, clowns, but it's tough being a puffin, not forgetting poison in its food, which the puffling will be given. The mate returns. They're well protected here in the vegetation, but that's certainly not true out on the open ocean in winter gales. Many puffins and their young must be lost at sea, and so on the farms counts will be made every year now to assess the puffin picture, searching for their burrow containing their chick up to three feet underground. Now let's see, um, it takes two, is this the one? Welcome home. And this is the temporary home of the National Trust Rangers, whose job it is to count puffins, people and much else, including gulls. A smaller gull, named after its call, Kit Iwawak, the Kittywake. It feeds on small fish at the surface. Such prey is in big demand with other species at various steps, depending on how deep they can dive. And that's where they get entangled in discarded or lost plastic fishing gear, some of which continues to catch and kill so-called ghost nets. With all these ingredients, with plastic, poisons in their food and climate emergency, the puffin picture is becoming more and more important to people and not just tourists. As gulls multiply along with our rubbish, they become ever bolder and they have chicks to be fed. As they grow, so do their appetites, and they soon start to learn to fly, like the passing puffins. So the puffin picture includes pirates as well, intercepting and robbing, depriving the puffling down below in its burrow, and the parent will have to go fishing again. Bad news for the kittiwake, but good news for the scavenging blackback gulls and their chicks, also a useful role in clearing up the place. The farns are famous for their grey seals, a species which makes up a significant proportion of the world population. On the farms, it's estimated that there are about three to four thousand grey seals here. Counting any species that spends time ashore at the sea surface or under it is a challenge, and it depends a lot on the weather. 
Diving is important to check the state of the seabed. And you might meet a puffin down there hunting for its lunch or to feed its chick back in the burrow, which must be counted too. But is this one from a thousand breeding pairs, three thousand, even up to 56,000? The puffin picture's getting clearer, and don't forget those nurdles. We're landing on the island of Inner Farm, which has or had 70,000 puffins, alongside a noisy, somewhat aggressive group of Arctic terns. Nearby is the small chapel of St Cuthbert. On a trip like this, visitors can find out about the extraordinary life of seabirds and their connection with the seas and shores around us, like the vital food supply for this older chick. They always seem to be hungry because soon they'll be heading south right across the globe. Arctic turns to the Antarctic, fueled on fish alone. And of course their food eats much smaller things like plankton. And now as we found out, those tiny plankton ingest microplastics produced by us. It's potentially a food chain of death and if those small fish, like sand eels, are fed to salmon in salmon farms, you might like to think about that next time at a supermarket. For the moment, Arctic terns seem to be okay. But what about the puffins? Turns wander about, so do people, and signs say so. Rather different nest boxes protect the eggs and chicks from gulls and bad weather. His own private bungalow. A very different home than the puffling in its burrow. These turns are a bit odd. On one hand they seem attracted to people and their buildings even rearing their chicks on the roof. <laughs> on the other hand, they'll attack visitors, sometimes drawing blood on your head. So hats are advised. You're safer inside. Puffins are a money spinner for the National Trust. More and more people visit the farms, but do the puffins. They're here for the spring and summer only, spending autumn and winter at sea, when they lose that colorful covering of their famous beak, the circus outfit. Now for some numbers in our puffin picture here in the farms. A stronghold, but for how long?
is what's happened. 3,000 breeding pairs in 1939. Since the UK's first big systematic seabird census started in 1969, every count has shown a steady increase, peaking in 2003 with 55,674 pairs. That's good counting. But in 2008, the numbers fell by a third to 36,835 pairs due to a very rainy summer. Since then, the population has slowly been recovering. It's probably stable these days, but we'll have to see and look elsewhere too. Will the tidings be glad elsewhere in the many other places the Atlantic puffin breeds? Will its home become increasingly contaminated by what we chuck into it? Is that a salmon sandwich by any chance? With nurdles on the side? We're all in this together. Time for the day trippers to leave after a great visit, meeting lots of different seabirds, each with its own niche. including those elegant but ferocious arctic terns. A turn up for the record book, one ring as a chick was found dead near Aberdeen having flown one and a half million miles to the Antarctic and back over 32 years. The planet has changed a lot in that time, as Bambra Castle may remind us. But in particular, wildlife has had to adjust. Some win, some lose. But if the ocean is severely damaged, we are all losers. And now we know it, with Extinction Rebellion, Greenpeace, and the National Trust and so on. Dolphins, puffins, pandas will always be popular. But what about plankton? No votes. But they are more important than all the rest. They run the planet and us. Dolphins get trapped in fishing nets and drown. Some supermarkets claim dolphin safe products but some don't. Increasingly, the public can put pressure on large companies to change their ways in this environmentally conscious age. People want to know where things have come from and what the true cost is to the planet, whether it's a puffin t-shirt or a toy. Not far from here, as the puffin flies, around the corner geographically, is the Firth of Forth and its famous two bridges. Which brings us back to that huge company Ineos and those notorious nurdles produced here. More than 300 billion nurdles are manufactured at nearby Grangemouth every week. Inevitably, some go astray. At North Queens Ferry, on Ferry Craig's Beach, children from a local primary school collected 330,000 nurdles in the Great Nurdle Hunt. Nurdles have been found in the stomachs of seabirds and other marine animals. They're very difficult to remove and are found across the whole of the UK, from Grangemouth here to Galapagos, Cape Town to Canada. INEOS says it's investing millions in new technology and it can well afford to, as its boss is Sir Jim Ratcliffe with a previous estimated fortune of £18 billion, third in the Sunday Times rich list. 
The industry plans to grow the plastic business by 30 to 40 percent over the next 20 years. So that's an awful lot of nurdles, especially as the world is trying to cut back. So this becomes a public relations exercise. By using the INEOS name, some people and the press have accused Sir Jim Ratcliffe of greenwashing with the cycling team INEOS in the Tour de France. He's keen on fracking too. The public is getting suspicious about this kind of thing and in this case the plan faces a big challenge. Because what INEOS makes and we use in so many ways seems to be getting out of control. Tiny micro beads, micro plastics, micro all sorts are filtered into the tiny plankton. The basis of the food chain in the sea and along it is our not so comical friend the puffin. Pairs for life and rejoins its mate after months separated at sea. It would seem Sir Jim and his PR machine could be up against it. Can it be true that they're killing puffins? And their nurdles are turning our beaches into disaster zones. So it's time to survey the puffin situation, indeed the whole seabird situation. Formers that spread right around the world are a success story. They took advantage of the spread too of fisheries that dumped stuff at sea. Now plastics may look similar and it's the chick on the receiving end plus a blocked stomach and therefore starvation. There'll be nurdles in there too in the so-called flying dustbin. Losers. At the other end of the world, the destination of that Arctic turn, the Antarctic, a wandering albatross feeds, well is it food, to its chick. Back in the Arctic, plastics fall in snow. There are now an estimated 5.25 trillion pieces of ocean plastic debris. A recent report estimated that by 2025 the quantity would treble. It's already in the Mariana Trench in the Pacific, the deepest known point in the oceans. Then there are the rats, never very popular. In the remote Shant Islands in the Hebrides in Scotland, black rats were thought to have arrived on an 18th century shipwreck. In April 2012, the survey estimated 3,600 rats on the islands, eating seabirds, eggs and chicks. But in March 2018, six years later, they'd all gone. And here's how. The rat eradication took place during winter 2015-2016 using poison baits. It was a tough job living in the only house on the islands. Pretty basic. But thanks to RSBB Scotland, Scottish Natural Heritage and the Nicholson family who have been custodians of the Shants for three generations, it's been a success. With puffins, 10% of UK puffins, some 62 1,900 pairs. And using their cackling calls played back at night, the hope is to attract Manx shearwaters to breed on the shants. That would be good news. And more good news about the same problem, winners. On Lundy Island in southwest England, rats have been eradicated too. Puffin numbers plummeted from over 3,500 bears in 1939 to just 13 birds in the early 2000s. Not a lucky number. But now puffins have bounced back to 375, with the total seabird population tripling to 21,000 on this now rat-free island. But now for some worse news. 
food and climate and overfishing, all connected. Sand eels, once so abundant, they were burnt as fuel in a Danish power station. It's crazy use of a critical basis of the food chain. Vital foods for puffins, if they can find it, because climate and currents affect where the sand eels go. And the public are being asked to send in their pictures in a citizen science project run by the RSPB, the so-called pufferazzi. Old photos could reveal changes in the food supply, which may contain plastics and may be used as fish meal at salmon farms. This is a huge business in Scotland and is proving to be very controversial. As with any intensive farming, there are problems of disease, parasites, and in this case, competition with seals, which happen to be here in the first place and may get shot. These fish factories can produce cheap salmon for supermarkets, but whenever a big new one is pushed, there's fierce opposition. The National Trust for Scotland has warned that a large salmon farm beside the Hebridean island of Canna could destroy its culture and wildlife, including many seabirds. £600,000 have been spent clearing the island of rats. The proposal by Moe, a Norwegian multinational, if approved, could mean the return of the rats on servicing and other vessels. So just how threatened are our seabirds, especially our star, the puffin? Well, on the Farne Islands, their numbers seem pretty stable. In other places, it's bad news and good, with marine protected areas helping. For example, seahorses and basking sharks now being tracked with a shark cam, an aquatic drone, as it filters plankton, the basis of all life in the ocean and ultimately on the planet. And nowhere is this more evident than on a remote outest of the Outer Hebrides, St Kilda, home for the summer of one million seabirds, including gannets, fulmers and puffins. No, these are not the infamous Scottish midges. They're puffins, said to be uncountable. Overhead, underground, on and under and out at sea. That's quite a challenge. But the puffin has been added to the red list and classed as vulnerable. Seabirds are amongst the UK's most important bird life and globally admired. When the adults and their pufflings separately leave here at the end of summer. They'll face storms at sea, have to dive for fish in a changing polluted sea and into an uncertain future. And the pair will have to find each other again next spring. That's the puffin picture. <laughs>